Great, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I appreciate your making time on this uh, beautiful Monday morning. Um, it, why don't we start off, and to be clear, these are the candidates running, the Democratic candidates running for um, the nomination for Congressional District Number 4. Um, how about if we start off with um, Doyle, if you wouldn't mind just kind of telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're running. Great. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for having me, uh, Helen and Chris. It's great to be here. My name is Doyle Canning. I use she, her pronouns. I live in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with the Oregonian about my candidacy for Congress in Congressional District 4. For 20 years, I have worked as a progressive policy strategist, facing off with Wall Street banks, big polluters, billionaires, and the politicians that they pay for. I am under no illusions that powerful interests in Washington will give up without a fight, or that we have time to drag our feet when it comes to the climate crisis. My record of progressive leadership is consistent, and that is the leadership that we need and deserve in Congress now. I'm here today because I learned what injustice looked like before I blew out the candles on my seventh birthday cake, when my father was too violent in our home, and the families next door would take care of me, keep me safe, taught me the value, of solidarity, and community. Because if the police came, when they came, they would make excuses and they would never intervene or arrest my abuser. That experience imprinted on me at a very tender age that there are two systems of justice in our country, one for the powerful and one for the rest of us. And that's what made me a community organizer, eventually sent me to law school, why I got involved in politics. Because I know that this unequal system has created multiple crises in our country and that politics as usual won't deliver the solutions that we need now. When a fossil fuel company wants to bulldoze Southern Oregon to build their pipeline or billionaires squeeze their workers while paying close to nothing in taxes or a Republican legislator pushes laws to criminalize abortion care or care for your transgender child. As Democrats, we should organize and we should fight back but we should not be surprised because this is after all what fossil fuel companies and billionaires and Republicans do. What we should be shocked by and what we should be outraged by is when politicians let them get away with it. The climate emergency, Trump's attacks on our democracy, poverty, the housing crisis, threats to reproductive health, decades of racial injustice, all of this is too urgent for us to continue to wait for politicians who have shown us that they will side with the powerful while taking their money. That's why I am running for Congress. We deserve a Democrat who is unbought, unafraid, and has the consistency and moral clarity to lead for our country now. I will never do the bidding of billionaires or the fossil fuel industry. I will never give up on the promise of progressive change through people-powered democracy. I have always been, always will be in this for Oregon's future. Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you. Val, would you mind going next? Uh, not at all. Um, so thank you for the opportunity um, to speak with you. Um, my name is Val Hoyle. I am currently Oregon's Labor Commissioner. I've had the great honor of representing Oregonians and people um, here in, in Lane County over the past uh, 10 years, uh, both as legislator, as majority leader, and as labor commissioner. And previous to that, um, my husband and I moved here over 20 years ago to raise our children based on the quality of life and the reputation of the school district. I got involved in politics because I found out about Measure 5 and wanted to make sure that we had better schools. I struggled in school and know what it means to have it, to to need a strong public education. So I've knocked on doors, I became chair of the party, I helped get pro-education Democrats elected, and I knew how to organize because I came from a family of organizers, of activists. My father was president of his union, 
Uh, my grandfather, you know, was an immigrant that that helped uh, join the newly founded laborers union in New York for better wages, hours and working conditions. And I worked with Unite here um, in college before I got into the bike industry, spent 25 years in the bicycle industry. The bottom line is um, I know right now it is really important that we continue to have strong leadership. In the fourth congressional district, we've punched above our weight class for a very long time because we've had Peter DeFazio, who is an incredibly strong voice for this particular district. And it is a diverse district. It's 250 miles of the coast, right? Where we used to have five de elected Democrats four years ago, we now have one, and then Eugene and Corvallis, which is really progressive. So it is a diverse district with many different needs and we need someone that will stand up for working people. So when I found out that Peter DeFazio was planning to retire, I had to think long and hard what I wanted to do and where I could serve my community the best, whether as labor commissioner, and as you all know, I'm really passionate about the work we've done and how we've transitioned that agency to be more accountable to people and um, you know, just provide better service to both business and labor. But right now I called my cousin, I was talking to family and he said, so you just told me you think that we're on the verge of losing our democracy. And you're wondering whether or not you're gonna sit on the sidelines at this point in time. And I thought, you know what? I'm coming in because I know I can win this seat. I know I can be a strong fighter and I know I can continue representing the working families here in the fourth congressional district. Great, thank you so much. And Andrew, if you wouldn't tell us, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, I grew up the son of public school teachers, labor Democrats, uh, and we had a Sunday morning ritual where we would, um, dad would pop in a, a, a VHS. This is this is DVR for old people, uh, if there are younger folks watching this. Um, and he would record the Sunday morning political talk shows and we would come back from church and we'd have some some bagels and all that. Uh, and he would throw in that, uh, that uh, videotape and for the next hour, he would sit there and I would hear him rant and rave uh, against politicians, usually the Republicans, but sometimes the Democrats. Um, anytime he thought that people were putting their own ambition over the, the duty to the, their constituents, or anytime that he felt like uh, they were putting the interests of the powerful over the interests of the people, uh, he, like Val's dad, was head of his uh, labor union in his small town, his, his school district, uh, for several years. Um, and, and, and even though he told uh, me son, don't ever go into politics. His actions and those of my mother spoke louder than words. They were truly active citizens. The first ones bringing folks to town meetings, the first ones making phone calls, putting up yard signs. Uh, and so ever since childhood, really, public service has been at the heart of our family life and the heart of what I've been thinking about in my entire career, uh, whether that was in college and law school, in the nonprofit sector as a civil rights attorney at the ACLU, in government itself, and then in global business at Airbnb. At every stage, the question for me has been, how do I learn how to leverage the institutions of American power for the benefit of working people? That has been the goal. And so now that brings us to 2022. Um, and your question about why you're running is an incredibly important one. Uh, and the truth is that I wouldn't be running if I didn't think that this was the best way this job and this moment, the best way that I could serve my community at this time. Uh, some people have asked, you know, um, it's your first run for political office. Why don't you run for a lower office? Uh, and I sort of reject the premise of the question first, because I don't see it as higher or lower. Um, for instance, the work that Val's doing right now as labor commissioner is incredibly important work. So is the work of the state legislature. So is the work of our local school boards. Um, the jobs are different though, and they require different set of skills uh, in order to tackle the challenges that we face at any particular level of government. Uh, and so you want somebody in Congress who has a background in national security, as I do as a, as a fellow at the Truman National Security Project. You want someone with an understanding of global business and trade, especially because Oregon and this corner of Oregon uh, uh, being open to the world is so important uh, for the future of our economy. And you want somebody, I think, uh, who has a real sort of lived experience with the challenges that are facing so many Americans today. Uh, as a millennial, I faced six-figure student debt out of, out of law school, wasn't able to pay it off until my mid-30s. That delayed the home buying process for us. And we get uh, a child care bill in the thousands every month. And, you know, as I say to people across the state, we are the luckiest ones. We can afford those bills, but the vast majority can't. And so I think 
uh, having representation in Congress uh, from a new generation who has experienced those things head on and who is trying to see what the next generation will experience through the lens of, of my kids is incredibly important. So I'm honored to, to be part of this campaign um, with Doyle, with Commissioner Hoyle and others, uh, and I'm grateful for your time today. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Um, these questions are going to differ from candidate to candidate um, at times, and all uh, with some of the ones that are similar, I'll try to kind of rotate who starts first. Um, but Val, uh, let's just kind of get into this right now. Um, you were a staunch supporter of the Jordan Cove LNG project, despite uh, strong opposition from an array of community groups. Um, the project has since been scrapped. But how do you square your support for this, which if built would have been the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in Oregon with your, your positioning as a climate activist? Thanks, I appreciate that question. I came into, we all come into politics from a different place and I came in through the labor movement and you know, seven to 10 years ago, there were many of us that thought that natural gas would be that transitional fuel. It, it was con you know, considered a bridge fuel that would help move us away from coal, which is where I was at. But the bigger issue is I live right now in a rural community and I've represented a rural community for a long time. And for 30 years down here, rural Oregonians have been promised green jobs, right? And um, when I would talk to people in Coos Bay, in Coos County, what they said was that these 6,000 jobs would be transformational. And that's who I listened to. Look, I, you know, I, I'm always willing to listen to the science and I'm always willing to learn. And if we only talk to the people who have always believed what we believed about climate, right, then we're not going to get to where we need to go. So fundamentally, I have learned more about the negative impacts about natural gas extraction and methane leakage during transport. You know, at the time, the price of green energy sources like solar, you know, was more expensive. That's coming down. I have stood talked with the building and construction trades, with mine workers, with the head of the mine workers union about how we transition to a green economy without leaving workers behind. Because for too long, I think the environmental movement has left workers behind. So I think we do need to have a green blue alliance. And the reason that I was endorsed strongly by Senator Jeff Merkley and just recently received the endorsement of the League of Conservation Voters is they know that when I say that I'm going to do something, I will be effective. I am the only candidate in this race that has passed environmental legislation, gotten clean fuels off the floor of the House, and I will be able to do that in Congress. But more importantly, I have the trust within the rooms of people like the building and construction trades with those workers, with workers in our rural communities to say, I will not support new LNG or fossil fuel infrastructure. I've said that to the trades, it was a tough conversation. They still endorse me because they believe me when I say, I will not leave workers behind and we need to have those jobs of the future. So look, I'll always admit what I've done, I'm fully transparent. Yes, I supported it at the time. I thought that was a good idea. I've committed not to support new fossil fuel infrastructure, but more importantly, I've committed to make sure that we bring workers along and bring jobs, whether it's pump storage, offshore wind. I mean, we, we have the potential of building a port, a port in Coos Bay that will be the first port ever to be powered fully by offshore wind. I'm really excited about that kind of infrastructure. And again, doing it in a way that doesn't leave rural communities behind. Great, thanks very much. Um, Doyle, I'm wondering if you can respond to that um, in part because Val raises the issue about um, that there are often competing needs um, and makes it difficult to say uh, or to take a, a yes always or no never kind of point of uh, view on certain issues. Um, can you address uh, both her answer but also just the aspect of how do you keep um, the, um, the needs of workers in mind as well? Thank you, Helen. Appreciate the opportunity for this dialogue. It's such an important one. You know, in 2009, I was at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, Conference in Copenhagen. And that was really the moment at which we thought that the United States would be 
uh, leading a, a renewal of the Kyoto Protocol under President Obama. Um, I was there with Bill McKibben going over the latest climate science in 2009 that showed the urgency of this decade to transition us off of all fossil fuels. And no one in that room, myself included, was ever confused about the fossil fuel industry's misinformation that somehow natural gas was not a fossil fuel or was less polluting than coal. That has been a deliberate campaign of misinformation by the fossil fuel industry to make sure that our politicians, including Democrats, drag their feet when it comes to climate action. You can count on me to move as quickly as possible and to always listen to the scientists and the impacted communities on the ground and not the fossil fuel lobbyists who are writing checks to my campaign because I won't accept any money from the fossil fuel industry ever. Never have, never will. And I won't be doing their bidding in Congress. So again, I'm in this race because climate can't wait. And I have been a consistent voice for climate justice for 20 years. I'm an environmental attorney, I'm a climate activist and a community organizer. And I've worked with impacted communities on the ground who live in the shadow of fossil fuel pollution, experience higher rates of asthma and cancer and heart disease, shorter lifespans, childhood, uh, childhoods <laughs> uh, marred by asthma attacks. Um, that's what would have happened to the communities in the Klamath in Malin, Oregon, where Jordan Cove wanted to build their pumping station. It was, an, an, it was a project um, laced with environmental racism. And I was clearly on the side of the tribes, the climate activists, the impacted landowners, the fishermen, and the majority of Oregonians who were saying no to the Jordan Cove project and yes to a renewable energy future. So, you know, we were on opposite sides of that fight and the majority of Oregonians want to see rapid progress on climate change now and want a climate champion in Congress, not someone who betrayed us and worked with Jordan Cove to bring a polluting project to Oregon. Now on the question of just transition, this is an area where I have spent a lot of focus in my 20 year career in climate politics. Most recently, I worked with a coalition in California of 20 labor unions, including the largest labor union in California, SEIU, but also under the leadership of Steelworkers Local 675 in Los Angeles. Unlike in Oregon, California has uh, active drilling in communities, even in urban Los Angeles. And the Steel, Steelworkers Local 675 represents workers who work not only in the oil refineries in LA County, but also, and in, in Kern County, but also uh, in a renewable uh, electric uh, bus manufacturing plant that has just opened in LA called Proterra. And it's getting funding from the infrastructure bill to build more buses that, that we'll be buying in Portland is my understanding. So an exciting and rapid transition is underway for the rank and file in this union. And they see, the steel workers see, the growth in their union is on the electric energy side, not in the fossil fuel sector. And they know that if, they're not, if labor is not at the table to shape this transition and make sure that renewable energy jobs are union jobs, uh, that labor will be, will be cut out of the deal. And we can't let that happen. So I was part of bringing together a coalition across in the sixth largest economy in the world to plan for a just transition off of fossil fuels and create 1 million new union jobs uh, in a, a carbon uh, friendly economy of California's future. That is the plan that I will bring to Congress. And it includes um, you know, specific measures like priority hiring, glide path retirement, um, uh, debt-free education uh, and other um, pathways uh, into, into uh, electric energy jobs and also cleaning up <laughs> the, the, the pollution of abandoned oil wells. I mean, there's so much work to do. And this false dichotomy. Um, okay, I would like to kind of move on. So if you can just kind of finish that thought would be, would be great. 
Thank you, Helen. I am so I have so much to say about this topic, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be heard. the The last thought I'll offer is that Jordan Cove, just like other fossil fuel companies, was very effective with a divide and conquer narrative and mindset, and really pitted working people and unions specifically against the other interests, tribes, environmentalists, fishermen uh, in Southern Oregon. And we can't let that kind of us or them mentality rule us <laughs> moving forward. We need to bring, uh, bring these interests together. And that's the opportunity of clean energy investments. And that's what I'll fight for in Congress. Great, thank you. Um, Andrew, let me ask you this. You had mentioned in your opening about people saying, well, you know, why, why go for Congress? And you don't see a difference between, you know, higher or lower office, whichever state or federal, but you would be one person among 435. Um, so it does raise a question about your experience and your ability to be effective in that large of a group. What would voters, what could voters expect to see as a result of your first term in office if you were elected? Sure. Good question. Uh, and I think it speaks to the need to be somebody who is willing to play ball with folks from across the country uh, in all sorts of different uh, types of jurisdictions, rural communities, urban communities. Uh, and I have worked in legislatures across the state and across the country uh, on a whole manner of issues. Again, whether that was at the ACLU when I was working in government uh, in New York City government, we had a sort of position uh, where a lot of people look to New York, just like they look to California down south um, for guidance on various issues. And so that was an opportunity to build a real national network and see how people do things in different places. So you're right, Helen, you got to get to 218 in the House of Representatives to pass something. And that requires uh, being able to work with folks from well outside the batteries of Oregon. In terms of my first term in office, uh, it's very difficult to be a freshman in Congress for many reasons. You don't have the seniority. Uh, you don't necessarily have the relationships uh, that you can lean on uh, that that somebody like Peter has had for the last few decades. But I think you don't start uh, in a position where you 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 sort of um, uh, handcuff yourself about what's possible. Instead, you dive into building those relationships, uh, not only across the aisle, but across the country. Uh, you start to sort of dig into the policy issues, uh, particularly on the, on the committees that you're assigned. I have some committees that I'd love to be a part of, but of course that's in the hands of, of people more senior than me. And I think importantly, you try to work with others to establish yourself as a member of that next generation of leaders who are going to stand up uh, strongly on certain issues that you feel like can unite the country. Uh, and I think the country is looking for that new leadership. We see it in the polling here in Oregon about how people are frustrated with the status quo, frustrated with the state of affairs. That's not just uh, an Oregonian thing. That is that is the type of, uh, of research that we're seeing across the country. And so I think being a freshman, you have the opportunity to come in with new eyes uh, and say, look, uh, Congress hasn't been up to the task of fighting our challenges uh, effectively. And I'm going to be part of that, uh, that next wave of leaders who's going to do things a little bit differently. So that's what I would be trying to do uh, in my freshman term. And just to follow up on that, what's, what's an example of something that you think could be a unifying issue that um, Congress can get behind and deliver for, for the American people? Well, I think that healthcare is a great one. I mean, because I, I've now met a single conservative uh, who doesn't want to have healthcare that is affordable uh, and accessible when they need it. Right? Uh, this is something that unites all of us as people because we have uh, we have human bodies, uh, and it should unite us as Americans. Uh, and so, whether it's uh, making sure that finally, finally, Medicare can negotiate prescription drug prices just like the Veterans uh, uh, Administration does, or whether it's making sure that uh, the Affordable Care Act has a list of preventive care that includes something like mental health treatment. Right now, you have to pay a copay uh, or coinsurance for mental health treatment. That shouldn't be the case, particularly with the mental health crisis that we're facing, especially among youth. These are the types of issues, pocketbook issues, fundamental issues of, of human dignity that I think unite people across the political spectrum, and we see huge support for. And I want to get, uh, I want to be part of that, that that new cohort in Congress who can really get behind it. Uh, the time for big pharma sort of owning Congress on these issues is over, uh, and we can unite the country behind those those types of common sense reforms. Great, thank you. Um, Doyle, same question for you. You don't have experience in elected office. So what could voters expect to see as a result of your first term if you're elected? And if you can offer a couple specifics, one or two specifics about you know, what, what you would be working on and what you would be trying to deliver.
thank you. I found my unmute button. <laughs> Appreciate the question. My political experience is working to fight for solutions for real people. In the worst days of this pandemic, I was working for the labor rights organization United for Respect. And I was preparing for a meeting with the incoming Biden White House labor advisor to discuss our priorities for essential workers. Anne-Marie Reinhardt Smith was our voice at that table. She had spent 30 years working in department store retail jobs. And as we prepared for the meeting, I asked her, what is the most important thing that you wanna tell these White House folks today? And she didn't hesitate. She said, we need a $15 minimum wage now. 725 is a starvation wage and we can't wait. And I share that story a lot because her words haunt me and they guide my campaign because about eight weeks later, Anne Marie uh, died of COVID-19. So I will take my experience fighting for people like Anne Marie at the highest levels of our government at the White House with me to Congress and make sure that, um, that their voices are heard. I was working in this Congress with United for Respect with Senator Sanders, chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, to push for the $15 minimum wage to be included in the reconciliation deal. That was dropped. It was not a priority because poor people's priorities haven't been a priority in Washington. And that's what's wrong with our system. That's why I don't accept money from billionaires or big corporations. That's why my campaign is powered by volunteers and grassroots donors. And that will be my approach to leadership in Washington. In terms of uh, my specific priorities, the $15 minimum wage clearly is one that's been on the table and that I've been fighting for since 2010. It's time to get it done. And uh, the political will is there. The president campaigned on, on a $15 minimum wage. Uh, and it isn't moving forward. That's largely in part to the influence of corporate lobbyists on a handful, on the entire Republican party, but also on a handful of Democrats whose ears are stuffed with money from big companies who think they would lose by paying their workers fairly. Um, so that is my approach. Uh, that will be my priority. Uh, I also will uh, work to champion our climate and climate change solutions. In Congress, Southwest Oregon is home to the best real estate in federal waters for offshore wind in North America. There are wind projects being stood up in Maryland and in Massachusetts because Senator Van Hollen, Senator Markey, they fought for those things to come to their states and I will fight for those investments to come to Oregon. Thank you. Um, and Val, while you do have uh, experience in elected office, you've never been to Congress before. So tell us a little bit about what you expect to deliver in uh, your first term if you're elected. So um, thank you. And I haven't been to Congress, but uh, you know, many years before I came here, um, I did work with my congressman when I was uh, in school in Massachusetts um, on the last immigration reform bill. That is something that has been a passion of mine. Again, as a second generation American, I know uh, married to an immigrant, it is, it is an issue that I, um, I care deeply about. And so I worked on public policy back in the eighties when I was in college, but fundamentally I'm the only person that has legislative experience. So when I was the majority leader, I ran after my first term because my caucus was predominantly made up of people from the Portland metro area. And no offense to you all, but here downstate, we felt like we needed a voice. So I ran to be a voice for labor and a voice for those democratic districts that had to represent downstate districts and rural communities. Um, when I was the majority leader, we didn't have any walkouts. And I worked very closely with Mike McLean. I passed progressive legislation, including increasing the minimum wage in Oregon. Um, and uh, very proud of that climate legislation. And I take a backseat to no one when it comes to fighting for workers. But fundamentally, I worked with um, was successful when we were 30-30 in the House, 
when we didn't have sort of a democratic working majority in the Senate, passing progressive legislation and making sure that the Republicans that were there also had their community interests represented and de helping deliver for them. Because again, I know what it means to have to deliver for a rural community in these places where people really need jobs, right? So whether it's as labor commissioner um, or it was in a legislative body, my reputation was as someone who was effective in being one of 90, right? Um, which means less raising your hand and saying, here's what I can say, uh, you know, in a megaphone um, and getting things done and allowing other people to take the credit. Fundamentally, I'm focused on jobs, apprenticeship, and fighting for infrastructure. And that's what I would fight for. I'm already working on it. As I said, I was talking with the head of the mine workers union. They've got some strikes going on and about how we can transition them to, to green jobs in terms of the steel workers and sheet metal workers whose endorsements I've gotten or the League of Conservation Voters. We're talking about how to invest in infrastructure for a green economy. I'm working with the company, um, North Point, who is bringing in the, the um, container port and also making sure that they have project labor agreements for all the work that's being done there and with offshore wind. I'm working um, with Peter DeFazio's office and with the committee on transportation and infrastructure to make sure that we get the investments in Newport for the levee that's holding back water that is really, really important to get fixed. And also over here in Springfield on 42nd Street. There are a number of projects that we need. And here's the thing that's not partisan, investing in infrastructure. Well, I would say it wasn't partisan, but the fact is Congress is so broken where we used to be able to agree in a bipartisan way on infrastructure votes. And now the 11 Republicans that voted on infrastructure are at risk of losing their committee chairships as opposed to Marjorie Taylor Greene or Madison Cawthorn, right? That's where we've gotten. So fundamentally, I'll work to get things done, but I have a history of being able to get things done for jobs, for families, for working Oregonians in the 4th Congressional District. Great, thank you. Um, and Doyle, if you could go first on this question. Um, inflation and the rising price of gas are among people's greatest concerns these days. What can and should Congress do to help alleviate that burden? For instance, would you support um, uh, temporarily suspending the federal gas tax or what other measures would you look to support? Thank you for the question. I have been outspoken in my support of a windfall profits tax for big oil uh, championed by uh, Congressman Ro Khanna. I have been taking on the oil industry for a long time, standing with communities like in Coos County who are seen as collateral damage in the path of their pipelines for their profits. I've seen how fossil fuel corporations will bully, bribe, threaten, sue, surveil, and stop at nothing to protect their profits at the expense of people and our planet. So I'm completely unsurprised to see that while the price for a barrel of oil is low, the price at the pump for us is high. They are price gouging us because they can. The fossil fuel industry has been allowed to call the shots and write the rules in Washington for far too long. And that's why I'm in this race. That's why I'm in this fight. And I support the windfall profits tax as a solution that, that would uh, tax the largest oil companies and deliver a quarterly check for working Oregonians. This crisis also shows us though, that the path to a safer future is the path of clean energy. Oligarchs can't monopolize sunshine. And that is what I will fight for as your member of Congress. Thank Great, you. thank you. Um, and Val, if you can go next on that question, just, um, what would what can and should Congress do to, about inflation uh, and the price of gas? So first of all, I I agree with Ms. Canning. Um, the windfall profits tax, absolutely. The bottom line is gas companies are making you know record profits, and we're seeing high prices at the you know at, at the gas tank, and that is wrong. So you know they they shouldn't be allowed to profiteer off the current crisis in UK. Ukraine and pocket all this money while working families are struggling. 
Um, we have to consider a lot of options. I'm not an expert and I'm smart enough to know what I don't know. So I'll, I'll work with experts in the field to see what we should do. I do not think we should take a holiday off the gas tax. Um, that's That money goes to funding infrastructure and many other things. So I, 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 I don't believe that that's a good idea. Long-term, we need to make big investments in infrastructure and technology to make sure we're not dependent on fossil fuels, right? So I travel all around the state. I, I you know, I've spoken at as many World Chambers of Commerce while I've been Labor Commissioner, as I have union halls. And what I know is that people in rural Oregon and in frontier Oregon and eastern Oregon would love to have electric vehicles, but we don't have the electric infrastructure. So fundamentally, we need to invest in that infrastructure so we're not dependent on foreign fossil fuels. We need to make sure that those jobs are apprenticeable. We should be a leader in renewable energy. And if we can train our workforce for the jobs that are available. And again, I'm really proud of the work that we've done to expand the apprenticeship model, um, both inside and outside the building and construction trades, then people can make a living wage. We have to understand right now, you know, we've got war, we've got many things happening that are affecting inflation and, our, and, and COVID and the supply chain crisis. But fundamentally, um, good jobs, bringing back the child care tax credit and um, making sure that uh, gas companies aren't allowed to profit unethically. Uh, those are pretty much the top three. Thank you. Um, Andrew, same question for you on, infl on inflation and the rise in gas prices. What is it that Congress can and should do? Sure. I don't support a gas tax holiday for the same reason that Commissioner Hoyle just explained. It would uh, undermine our our uh, funding for infrastructure, and I think it's a bad idea in general. Prices are volatile. They have been historically. They will be in the future. Uh, and putting a holiday on the table uh, is a Band-Aid solution that doesn't actually uh, get at the real root of the problem. And the root of the problem is not just related to GAP. It's a cost of living crisis, truly. And so whether that's housing affordability, healthcare, I already mentioned, certainly energy, the problem is that people cannot pay the bills. Uh, and so I think Congress needs to move aggressively on housing, on health care affordability, on energy uh, to really tackle these challenges and get more money in the pockets of people who really need it in America, working class uh, residents. You can read, uh, and I'm sure you have read more uh, on my website about this at andrewcalic.com. But for instance, on housing, just in, in particular, we have a housing system where we subsidize luxury development like the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in downtown Portland. We subsidize the home Homes of millionaires through a mortgage interest deduction. And yet we have a housing voucher system that doesn't come close to meeting the need uh, for working class Americans and lower income Americans. I think we have that exactly backwards. And I think if Congress aggressively took action uh, on the housing issue, not only addressing vouchers, but addressing the need to build more, particularly here in Oregon, but across the country, I think that's where we can have the biggest impact on what is truly a cost of living crisis. One, one more thing about, about inflation. I am not in the, in the habit of promising things that I can't deliver. And I think this is particularly important for liberals. And I am a liberal. Uh, I'm someone who believes the government needs to act aggressively to ensure equal opportunity uh, and, and share prosperity. Uh, and if we pretend that Congress can just snap its fingers and solve the inflation problem, all that's going to do is we can trust in American institutions exactly what we don't need at this moment in time. The truth is inflation is a very tricky problem, and the Federal Reserve is probably the best equipped to tackle it in the near term with interest rate increases. They have to be judicious with that. They can't just put the economy into a nosedive uh, through interest rate increases. But I do think that Congress also has a role to play, again, on tackling the cost of living crisis more broadly. Thank you. Great, thank you. And actually, uh, that was a nice segue into my next question, which Val, I think you'll go first on, and that's about housing. Um, certainly, there is uh, a housing crisis, not just in Oregon, but across the country. And there's a lot of debate about what Congress should be doing in terms of additional rent assistance or um, more uh, uh, dedicated to affordable housing. What is it that you would, you would look for, or you would want to do if elected to this position? So the first thing I want to say is that the federal government has walked away from their responsibilities and investment in housing over, over many decades. Um, and also concurrently, 
um, walked away from investing in treatment of people with long-term behavioral and mental health issues, right? So um, there's issues of housing stock that we need to deal with. And um, the first thing that the federal government needs to do and that I would do in Congress is work with the federal government, state government and localities because the solutions that needed that it, that are needed in Newport, right, um, are different than the solutions that may be needed in Eugene. And both places we have a lack of housing stock. I think Mr. Kalik was correct. Um, you know, housing vouchers. Um, I, I have a, a sister who has a severe disability, and she's been um, waiting for a federal housing voucher for 12 years. She's been in a different state, um, and that's that's wrong, right? That is wrong. But I've also talked to employers on the coast and what they have said is the number one problem for them to recruit staff is a lack of housing stock. So in Newport, they have people who want to um, promote in the Coast Guard that are living in Albany or Salem. And so they can't get that promotion. So fundamentally it's housing stock. We need investments. Um, we need to look at building different it, it, like partnerships, public private partnerships to build housing. And certainly the number one thing that the federal government can do is invest in the housing first model. Um, and we've done, we have a number of pilot projects here, both for veterans um, and with tiny home villages here in the, in the Eugene area that I have participated in that are very successful, allowing people to get the help that they need and then having the housing to be stable because you can't address your mental health or behavioral health needs if you're living in your car, right? So uh, fundamentally, I think, the federal government needs to get back into the business of investing in housing. Thank you. Um, and Doyle, same question for you on, on housing, which is a national issue, not just an Oregon issue. What is it that you would want to, to do if elected to, to Congress? Thank you for the question. You know, three years ago, I walked out of the grocery store in Eugene and I saw a young mother with a baby uh, in a carrier and a toddler in a stroller. And she was holding a cardboard sign that said she was fleeing domestic violence and she needed help. And as a survivor myself, I stopped in my tracks and I decided to help her. What began in that moment was a three year journey to get that family rehoused in Eugene. She lived in a van in the mission with friends uh, in various situations for three years. Eugene has the shameful distinction of having the most unhoused people per capita in the United States. And I am the only one in this race that has been working on a plan to end homelessness in America in Congress. It's called the Homes for All Act. And the plan would build 12 million new public housing units uh, repeal the Faircloth Amendment, which is prohibitive of building new public housing in this country, uh, and build private permanently affordable rental units, which would drive down costs throughout the market. This is the scale of solutions that we need for Oregon and for this country, and that's why I'm running for Congress. I'm very proud to be the only one in this race who has the endorsement of a housing rights organization, Housing First UMQA, which has been working at the grassroots level in Douglas County to bring housing first solutions to the poorest county in our congressional district. Thank you. Um, and Andrew, you kind of started it off, so I don't know if you wanted to add anything more, but I did want to offer you that opportunity. Thanks. Just two quick points. First is that I think it's important to leverage the uh, the uh, uh, assets that we have uh, as as collective assets, public assets on the housing issue. Uh, and when I was living, uh, when I was working in New York City government, one of the things we did was we mapped every public parcel uh, in that vast uh, metropolis of eight and a half million people to try to figure out where could we build housing that was going to be permanently affordable because land cost is such a huge percentage 
of the per unit cost of housing. If you could reduce that to zero, work with nonprofit housing developers, that's a way to get the permanent affordability that we need that the market won't always create for you. Uh, obviously, market rate housing is going to continue to be the, the housing that is most, most uh, common in America, but we also need additional affordability. The last thing I'll mention is that this is not a Johnny come lately problem. And we shouldn't pretend that it is. Um, Oregon has the fourth largest uh, housing price appreciation since 1991. And there's a reason for that because we have the second fewest housing units per capita in Oregon. And so I do think that as a Democrat, I need to sort of look in the mirror and say, if we've been in power uh, for a decade or longer uh, in, in this state, why have we failed to address this challenge in ways that other states across the country have not? Why did it take so long to get to a bill like HB 2001 that tackled uh, historically discriminatory restrictive zoning laws? Why did it take so long uh, to get to a situation in which we were investing in housing first models? And I think that that is a fair question that we have to ask ourselves as Democrats. Um, and it's one of the reasons why people uh, have been responding and saying, you know what, the status quo has not solved the problems in the way that we need them to solve. And so uh, that's that's the only other comment I had to have. Thank you. Um, let's see, I have lost track of who should go first. Is it uh, Doyle? Um, I, th I think it's Mr. Kallick. Oh, 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 right. Actually, so, okay. I, I, <laughs> I think you might be right. And you know what, you're all going to answer this, so it's fine. Um, We've seen increasingly destructive wildfires in Oregon and across the, the West. The US Forest Service recently released a 10-year plan that emphasizes fuel removal, uh, selective logging, controlled burns, and other forest restoration and community resilience um, projects. Do you agree with this, pro with this approach? And, and what should, more should Congress be doing to help protect the West from wildfires? So I, I do agree in broad strokes with that approach, although I think it is much more complicated than just sort of a single uh, approach. It is very heavily dependent on sort of what piece of property you're talking about and the overlapping jurisdiction that the Forest Service has with the Bureau of Land Management and state and private landowners. Actually, there was somebody down in, in Gold Beach who was much smarter than I am about these issues who took out a big firefighter's map that uh, he happened to have in his home. He was he is a, a firefighter and heads heads into harm's way, uh, as so many of uh, our fellow Oregonians do. And he was showing me just exactly how these sort of parcels come together. And his lesson to me of that was that you needed this sort of cross uh, uh, group collaboration on questions like this. It can't just be the Forest Service. It has to be state and local government as well, in addition to private landowners. But I do think that we finally gotten to a point a uh, hundred years after the Forest Service said, we're gonna put out every fire everywhere, uh, where we understand that proper forest management involves controlled burns. Uh, that isn't the only thing that we do, but it is part of how we can mitigate the threat of wildfires going forward and do so in a way that's ecologically sound and, and protects both people and property. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see, now I guess let's go to to, to Val and then Doyle, you'll go first on the last question. Can I answer the wildfire question too? Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay, so that this is me, right? right. Um, so first, let's start by acknowledging the role of climate change in these fire seasons of drought, of climate change. And the bottom line is we have to keep that in mind. Um, I was evacuated um, from my home in the, in the last, uh, in the 2020 fires and worked with um, people up the Mackenzie and in um, uh, Jackson County and, and Clackamas County to help make sure that we had a firefighter recovery. Um, I was co-chair of the Wildfire um, Recovery Council to make sure that going forward, we could address these things um, in a more comprehensive and systematic way. Um, the reality is that clear cutting of vast swaths of old growth trees is a thing of the past, and that's a good thing for clean water, protecting endangered species and habitats. And we do have the ONC counties, which makes it a patchwork of lands that are all managed differently, private and federal and state lands. Fundamentally, we need to um, work together to protect riparian zones, to make sure that we're using sustainable methods to manage our forests, to bring those people who are forward thinking in the timber industry and, and the environmental community together. Uh, the governor has just um, led on passing a bill 
uh, legislation to do that in and putting money towards it in the legislature. We did that many years ago in Eastern Oregon. Senator Wyden uh, led on that. But that's what we need to do because it is in everyone's interest to get this right. It's complicated. Um, it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take somebody that actually has relationships and can get into the room with people across the political spectrum and all these interests. And I'm the only one that has the relationships to be able to do that. Great, thank you. And Doyle, if you can address the forestry, the, the wildfire question. Sure. Uh, on Labor Day in 2020, I got a call from my neighbor, Tim. He's a career wildland firefighter. And he said, Doyle, this is the worst fire weather I've ever seen. And these crews are spread way too thin. And if the wind doesn't shift, that fire is coming to Eugene. And thankfully the wind did shift you know, after 20 years in the climate movement, I never thought I'd see the day that I was uh, considering evacuating uh, Eugene. The valley floor was spared, but it was too late for towns like Blue River, where 20, the 2,500 Oregonians lost their homes and over 1,400 remained in motels and shelters nine months after the fire with nowhere to go because of our housing shortage. So these raging wildfires that burn down entire towns and create refugees in our own communities, this situation is a result of failed policy and choices made by politicians who are lobbied by the powerful to look the other way. Heat and drought created that firestorm weather, which was accelerated by the fossil fuel pollution that has damaged our climate. Utilities have not been forced to bury their power lines in fire prone areas, despite knowing that one spark can burn down an entire town. Decades of heavy industrial logging replanted with plantations create hillsides that go up like matchsticks. It's poor planning, shortcuts, cut and run to make their millions, leaving rural Oregon communities to suffer the cost and to pay with our lives. In Congress, I will fight for federal investments in proven fire preparedness and safety, bringing good federal jobs to rural Oregon, to create wildfire buffers around vulnerable communities, to harden and fireproof our homes and our towns, to reduce the fire risk from utility lines. We have to ensure that our forests are well managed for fire. And that means leaving the big trees that burn slowly standing. We can use the proven methods of the Native American tribes of the Northwest, prescribed burns in the wetter seasons that safely reduce fuels. And ultimately, we must tackle the root causes of climate change, which is fossil fuel pollution. And I'm the only one in this race that has worked with Tim and his Wildland Firefighters Advocacy Organization on federal fire policy in Washington, uh, advising him on how to move <laughs> good fire policy forward with Senator Wyden's office and in the Natural Resources Committee uh, in Congress. Great, thank you. Um, we are about out of time, um, but if, uh, I don't know if this is possible, but um, if you can answer uh, this question in like 20 seconds, 30 seconds or less, um, it's about Build Back Better. Um, and specifically, you know, um, the legislation passed the House, it uh, has stalled in the Senate completely. And I guess, Pretty simply, would you seek to um, repackage it in some way? And if so, what are the core parts? Or would you push for um, somehow uh, helping it, you know, it, pushing for it to continue to try to make its way through the Senate as is? Um, and Doyle, if you can go first, and again, just like 20 or 30 seconds. Sure. I think I'm the only one in this race who was working to move Build Back Better through Congress on both the labor side and the environmental side working to incorporate strong labor provisions of the PRO Act and the clean energy investments uh, on the climate side. And we did really well until we ran into a roadblock in the United States Senate. And that was a handful of Democrats who are uh, listening to their corporate lobbyists and fossil fuel profits more than climate scientists and the needs of our communities. And fundamentally, until we elect Democrats who are unbought and unafraid to fight for the change that we need and to work with the president to move his agenda forward. Uh, we won't we won't see progress in Washington. That's why. So, I'm so it sounds like you would you would want it to move forward as is. I'm ready to sit down in the table and work with anyone 
to get climate investments done. Okay, uh, Andrew. I think it's always a question of what is possible in the political moment that you're in. What is the public pressure that you can bring to bear on a particular issue? Uh, on the Build Back Better, I think one of the flaws was that we did have a lot of uh, programs in there that were simple and effective and proven and had bipartisan support. And then we had several uh, that were unproven uh, and had significant sort of doubts, even within the Democratic caucus about whether they should go forward. So if I were to tackle BBB again, what I would do is I would hone in on the things that we know have bipartisan support earned income tax credits, childcare tax credits, uh, the simple things that have real world uh, immediate results for people uh, in their pocketbook and in their lives. And I'd focus on those first. Thank you. And Val. Thanks. So first of all, the first thing we need to do to ensure that we pass Build Back Better, which is something I support strongly, is win more seats in the House and the Senate, hold the majority in the House. And as the only person that has won an election in a swing district in a difficult year in the fourth congressional district. Um, I know that I can hold this seat against Alex Carlisle. And then we need to fight to talk about what Democrats can bring to the table. And we need more votes in the Senate. Bottom line. Um, I, I think that there's a different role in legislating and being an activist. And being an activist is really important. It is to push people in government further than they think they can go, right? And then in governing, you need to work to within the art of what's possible and go further than anyone around you thinks is possible. And that's what I was highly effective in doing. So sometimes you move things across the floor of the house, right? Just like in Oregon, we had a more progressive pro-labor majority in the house. So we moved many things across the floor and they got changed in the Senate. But the bottom line is, in any negotiation, if you compromise up front and give up right away and don't make it difficult for people to say no, then you're never going to get to where you need to go. So I will work with activists. I will work with Democrats. I wish that there were there's a, a few Republicans that are willing to work in a bipartisan way. I'd work with them. But fundamentally, the things that are in the Build Back Better Act, specifically, you know, lowering the cost of medical equipment, the child care tax credit, which have child poverty, just something that really impacted the fourth congressional district. I would fight hard for that because I know what it's like to have to choose between paying for food or paying for rent and nobody should have to do that. So that's been my philosophy. I've been successful at it and I look forward to doing that in Congress. Great. Thank you all for making time to, to talk with us today. This was really a great conversation. I appreciate it.